Thank you, our viewers, for joining us this late morning on a beautiful, of course, cold Wednesday uh, morning here in Kampala and um, cold Kaga Baldwins, and we're bringing you a very quintessential discussion on a very peculiar subject of discussion, which is, of course, globally somehow controversial. And we're going to be discussing biotechnology and biosafety in Uganda, a science field which is indeed uh, taking on the world by storm for various reasons. And so in partnership with the United States Embassy in Uganda and the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation, we we'll bring you this discussion in conjunction, of course, with our station here at NTV, coming to you live from the Campus International Conference Center. Please. So I have a prolific panel, panel here which is going to have this topic indeed explicated for us to understand what is going on in the biotechnology and biosafety world of science. My panelists, please, you're welcome. I have Professor Nina Fedorov at the extreme left, Emeritus Professor of Biological Sciences, Pennsylvania State University. Quite <laughs> difficult to pronounce, but I hope uh, I'm making the point. Pennsylvania University, USA. You're a retired professor. And then in the middle, I have Prospero Grace Apologies on that. Dr. Teresa Sengova, the agricultural scientist and board chair, Uganda National Council for Science and Technology, and member governing council of the National Agricultural Research Organization, NARO. Great ladies, please you're welcome. Thank you. Thank okay, you. so let me start with you, Professor Nina. Uh, we have a definition for <coughs> the National Biotechnology and Biosafety Bill, which is being, uh, of course, uh, developed to become a law in Uganda and was set up in 2012 and defines biotechnology as being any technique that uses living organisms or substances from living organisms to make or modify a product, improve plant, animal breeds or microorganisms for specific purposes and biosafety is regarded as the safe development, transfer application and utilization of biotechnology and its products. So I just need you perhaps to expound on this in a brief manner but of course in a a common man's understanding what these concepts mean based on your experience and expertise? I think I have to start by saying that I'm going to focus on plants. They're genetically modified crops. The important thing for, to understand modern biotechnology is that we've actually been modifying plants to suit our purposes, to be better food, uh, to grow better for somewhere between 10 and maybe 20,000 years. In the 20th century, we, used, we began to understand genetics, which is the science of how genes determine the characteristics of an organism. And so we used genetics, and we used things like uh, chemical and radiation mutagenesis to make more differences, to create mutations, again, speeding up the process the natural processes to create organisms that were better crops, um, more disease resistant, more pest resistant. Biotechnology that we talk about today is the latest in the evolution of the molecular, of the um, plant breeding processes. Based on the knowledge that we gained over the last half century about how genes work, what they do, what their sequences are, we can take genes now from an organism and use it to enhance the properties of another organism. So for example, to make a maize plant resistant to an insect. So you literally interfere with the natural set of, or the natural inherent genetic nature of a plant and modify it to suit your own perhaps a, a plant characteristics that you feel should be up there in the world. Is that what you're talking about? When you talk about plant breeding, you I wouldn't use have an artificial manipulation and interference with the natural organic makeup of a given crop or plant so that you breed your own preferred kind of plant. I wouldn't call it interference. Hmm. It's, I would say it's optimization. This is what we've been doing throughout history, is making plants less toxic, more um, nutritious for us, and this is simply the latest way by adding a gene from someplace else uh, or modifying the genes of the organism to be, again, to have properties that are uh, more suitable to us. Okay. So it's, it's modifying mm -hmm. 
I would not call it interfering. All right, good. And uh, thanks for that uh, explanation. We are still going to dig into the whole intricacy of this uh, subject, but then we come to uh, Dr. Teresa. So uh, part three of the 2012 National Biotechnology and Biosafety Bill uh, gives a litany of issues that are supposed to be dealt with, which includes, of course, appro approval of research and general release of a GMO, the stage of research, approval for each stage of research. This is at the tables of parliament. Uh, the bill was passed in 2012, but at this time there's been a grapple uh, to have it actually passed. So there's the, lab the requirements for laboratory experiment. There's need for application for approval to conduct confined field testing of a GMO. Conditional approval, suspension or revocation, things you know about. So uh, just help our viewers to understand uh, some of the major uh, elements, the core features of this bill. That, that you feel are uh, supposed to be understood by the public, because I, I need us to communicate to the public things that we're trying to advance in this bill. Thank you very much. The first thing to understand is that the bill is regulatory. The bill is trying to put in place a system that will be used by the scientists, that will later be used by the, the regulators to be able to make the best use of this technology, but in a safe and sustainable manner. This technology is regulated world over, not because it is bad, but it because it is relatively new. Not everybody understands it that well. So you ha we have the Ugandans who have the capacity and understand the, the molecular work or the GMO development the, very well. Hmm? So those are the people who want to put maybe like regulators we have the scientists who can make the products. Scientists who have been trained in different universities in this world. They are coming together and coming up with the products where they are needed by our farmers. Where there is a problem which you want to overcome. So they put uh, their product to the regulators who should also be competent and have been prepared for so many years to be able to check what the scientists are bringing on the table and make sure that it is safe for use by our people and then approve it. So we are, it is really regulatory so that scientists don't do anything or whatever they want. No, they do something according to set procedures, safe monitoring, safe evaluation and then use. And Dr. Semua, you feel we have the capacity to do the regulation, to do the monitoring, to do the, the blockaging of actually uh, uh, maybe hideous and uh, uh, and products that can be of a dangerous nature. Do you feel we have the capacity as scientists? And uh, of course it puts into question scientists, monitoring scientists, and uh, how that comes to play into the favor of the general population. We have the capacity. We have been developing this capacity maybe now for more than 15 years. That is the agriculture, uh, in the agricultural sector. Uh, as I said, we have people with PhDs and they've specifically worked even on Ugandan problems to be able to find solutions. They've been in South Africa, America, Aus Australia, UK, Belgium, name it. Hmm? We have the capacity to make the products and even as the scientists start saying, okay, I want to do ABCD, there is already a system to make sure that we understand or the other experts understand what they want to do. Mm -hmm. And why do they have to use this particular method of transformation mm -hmm. to be able to get the product? Okay, mm -hmm. good. And so uh, the capacity, I can assure you, yes. we have the capacity to make the products and to regulate the products. Mm -hmm. And you know, training, uh, capacity building never stops. If there was anything somebody didn't understand, we, we can refer to all, all, all the expertise we have in the world. Mm -hmm. WHO, for example, we have experts there, uh, World Health Organization. If there was anything controversial, we also can we refer to those other expertise which are available globally. Okay, yes. well said. And uh, uh, Professor Nina, uh, we, we need now to get into the specifics just before I get into a short break. Uh, what products specifically are you talking about now, in case you're trying to encourage a Ugandan, a Ugandan lawmaker or the audience, that we are developing and projecting to the, to the population to adapt? Uh, because people have talked about you mechanizing an organism, it becomes literally like a robot, a, a living robot in itself. You have uh, plants that have been doctored and they are synthetic. What propositions are you making in terms of products 
and the developments across the world that you want? The They're not robots. All right. Mm -hmm. They are plants, usually with one or two extra genes. So one of the things that's been a problem for banana farmers is banana wilt disease. And scientists here have taken genes from a sweet pepper and put them into the banana. They're genes that protect the sweet peppers, and it turns out that they work very well. In bananas, it's not a sweet pepper. It's a banana that is now resistant to the bacterial wilt. Mm -hmm. We don't transform one organism into a completely different one by adding one gene. Um, another example is maize that's resistant to fall armyworm. One gene. Mm -hmm. okay. So those are the kinds of things that are really lined up and ready to go. Mm -hmm. Okay, there, so many other or there are many other examples, but those are two. There are no synthetic genetic uh, manufacturing that are inserted, perhaps chemical genetics that are uh, infused into an organism so that you can transform it in a certain way. You mean you simply adapt a gene from one living on organism to another? Is that the principle that you're talking about that, as you're using? That is correct. Now, you do have to get the gene from here to there. Getting genes into plant cells is something that bacteria know how to do, and actually people have adopted that natural genetic engineer and asked it to say, instead of delivering uh, genes that it likes, it de de deliver this gene, mm -hmm. because it will make the plant resistant now to the disease. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to probe much further, eh? of course, into uh, the more intricate aspects and the controversies of uh, the genetic modified organi organisms and the science of biotech, of course, and the biosafety that is implied. And we are online, uh, on YouTube, we are on Facebook, we are on Twitter, and you can go and make your contribution there. I've already seen the contributions that are being made. And after this break, I'm going just to cite out some of those particular opinions that you're making. Let's go for a short break, and we'll be right back. continue to go and cont rather contribute. Pick mm. out. Apologies on that. Thanks our viewers for coming back with us. And uh, I'm looking through the Facebook responses. And of course, there's on Twitter and we're live on YouTube. And uh, I'm seeing Tesla Issa saying that this is a sure death therapy in daily dosage. <laughs> and uh, then a while Michael says that originally the Lord our God gave us seed freely. Our culture also was that, uh, was that if led here, you had a, p okay, uh, it's quite an intricate uh, response. Uh, Rijema Marie says that they are the worst. The worst is our native seeds are getting out completely. Yet these modified ones just have products which are big, but no test, just chemicals. So Dr. Nina, Professor Teresa, you can hear the responses from the public. And uh, so we, we need to first of all understand. You, you, I was given by uh, your team a compilation of the issues that usually uh, are, are raised by the public, and uh, that is coming from the Uganda Biosciences Information Center. And uh, you make a response to the impact of GM crops on human health. You say that numerous studies conducted over the past three decades have supported the safety of food derived from GM crops. Consumers have been eating food containing uh, GM ingredients since 1996 with no evidence of harm demonstrated so far. Uh, but you can hear the fear out there. Even if you made this just a, a very open dialogue with the community hall, uh, you would get the very uh, wrathful kind of response, uh, negative, either out of naivety or perhaps out of uh, their own experience. So give us the evidence basis you are 
just grounding your proposition for us to have the law and to have GMO products. What was the evidence basis that was considered to have GMOs promoted in Uganda? Dr. Teresa. Okay. <coughs> um, the scientists, they get the jobs of being, for example, a breeder because uh, there are so many challenges in agriculture which need to be overcome. And some of those challenges can best be tackled using modern methods. Mm -hmm. If there is a modern method which can help you to overcome a challenge and you are employed to overcome that challenge, definitely you would also want to explore that modern method. So what is happening is that uh, in agriculture today, like in Uganda, we have specific problems. For example, there was a cassava, cassava brown spot. The cassava brown spot uh, virus, uh, you can see the plant can look okay, but underneath the roots are rotting. Now, when you are faced with such a challenge, as a scientist, as a breeder, or even as a director in Nero, you have to look for solutions. Because every time you go to meet farmers, they'll be showing you that such a challenge, such a problem. So, uh, in a such a case, there can be the option of using modern biotechnology and overcoming that problem. Mm -hmm. So, why, can't, why don't you use it? So, it is in that context that scientists in this country should be able to use the modern technology to overcome our farmers' problems. We are working on uh, crops like cassava. It's Uganda. It is African. Very important to us. It's not um, important to other people, but we have to master the technology to be able to improve our cassava, to improve our bananas, to save the maize, for example, from drought. Um, if you go to Kasese during a maize season, you can be impressed. You have acres and acres of maize. People are coming from the mountains to come and grow maize here, and apparently they would go back after harvesting their crop. But sometimes they are hit by drought. Oh my goodness, they are hit by drought, and people go back without a harvest. If you're a scientist, and you know there is a technology which can help you to, uh, to help farmers, farmers whom you are working for, why don't you use that technology? Now, when you use that technology, apparently, as I said, it is regulated. So that means it's supervised. It's supervised. Mm -hmm. So that you don't go overboard, you don't do it. So you are it's regulated and uh, your worker is monitored so that you get the product which is which is needed and which is going to help this country mm. transforming its agriculture. And about, by the way, I have to add, not the GMOs when they're produced, they will not be pushed on people. It will be just like one variety out of so many varieties. It's a choice. Mm -hmm. It's something being put in the basket of our people, and they have the opportunity. Those who know about it, those who want to use it, will use it. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure others will copy. True. Yes. Okay. If uh, it is good, if it's a good technology in agriculture, it will just go by itself. Yeah, so the and adoption was uh, taken on because of crisis and the, uh, the because chronic Because of the needs. Yes, all right. And the offer, what the technology offers. Yes. yes. So, Professor Nina, you see GMOs are suspected to be a double edge. That as you do this particular modification, okay, as you have advised me, somebody can, for good, somebody else can actually do it for bad. And uh, in the highly influential U.S. National Research Council, which I guess you're very familiar with, with a report titled that Biotechnology Research in an Age of Terrorism, Professor Gerard Fink expressed concerns about the ever-present dual potential, what I'm talking about, the double-edged sword, of this kind of research when he argued that almost all biotechnology in the service of human health can be subverted for misuse by hostile individuals or nations. So you, you are a biotechnical or biotech scientist, and of course you're very enthusiastic about this. But don't you feel the dangers of this particular technology? So uh, what is your advice uh, on how to deal with these risks? And do you understand the risks that people are actually afraid of? Yes, I do understand them. I personally think that Jerry Fink's uh, concern is overblown because there are an awful lot easier ways mm -hmm. of doing harm than developing, say, a crop that's poisonous. And if you have part of the function of the biosafety um, and the oversight committees, is to make sure that never gets out. Now, I would say the more common issue might be that a gene turns out to be, uh, to encode an allergen. That is a protein that people are allergic to. And 
in the U.S., the the regulations about biotechnology are, are are phrased in such a way that the testing for allergenicity or toxicity happens way before, and that material goes to the Biosafety Committee. And before anything is released, uh, the Biosafety Committee makes sure that it is uh, positive, that all the data are there, that the scientists have done their work. So. Um, Again, to go back to the scare tactic. <laughs> okay. Um, Th that's your definition, yes? It, um, no. The, uh, so you Fink mean is, uh, Professor Fix didn't Fink, actually do... Professor Fink is an extremely uh, eminent scientist. Mm -hmm. But these kinds of concerns have existed for many, many years. And frankly, when people set out to do <coughs> harm, as you look around the world, mm -hmm. they're not often doing harm. The worst things that, it, uh, that we've seen is people growing known toxic bacteria, anthrax. So to, do, to create something anew and get it into the system is very difficult and takes an awful lot of knowledge. So the chances are that when people set out to do harm, they, they pick much easier techniques. That said, you've got the Biosafety Committee that is overseeing this process and making sure that the developments are positive mm -hmm. and useful. Okay, thanks. And uh, do Dr. Teresa, th let's talk about the stakeholder engagement uh, because you're talking about farmers, you're talking about politicians, you're talking about the, an entire population very, very concerned about these particular products and this science. And uh, local farmers uh, see GMOs as being destructive to the natural fertility of soils which they have cultivated for centuries with very few problems. They interfere with the inherent indigenous crop breeds of the nation through cross-pollination and instead the farmers have to resort to commercial dependence uh, on fertilizers, chemical fertilizers, and of course buying seeds. These are concerns which are actually brought in by the populations that use these products and consumers all over the world, including North America. Dr. Uh, Nina, you are pretty familiar with this. They're claiming that GMOs cause cancers and they're a slow way to depopulate the world. So I need you to help us understand the kind of stakeholder engagement. Besides scientists, how do you population in the world to make sure that people agree to this science that you're proposing? I think the first thing is to have a law. Mm -hmm. Because when you have a law, the people who debate for the law, the people who review and eventually pass the law must understand. So these ones have, have, been, have been in Uganda engaged as much as possible so that uh, they understand what the science are doing, what the products look like, so that they, they, they are comfortable. By the time the members of parliament passed the bill, they, they had visited the research institutes, they had uh, talked to different scientists. So they, they were pretty, a number of them are, are pretty conversant mm -hmm. with what we're talking about. And in fact, even others, some, some others are sort of halfway, but they're always invited to come to the laboratories, to come to the fields, so that they can get full information from the people who are really using their hands and brains to get these products. Mm -hmm. um, so the most important thing is to have the law so that you can check the material. You have a system that will check whatever is coming out to be used by the public. Okay, so of course, in addition, the, the, the law provides for consultation. Exactly. The law so provides for, for feedback from the public at a certain time. So, you know, I think that, that it's open like any That's other. before you make the, because I felt, mm -hmm. I, I think the law is a culmination from the consultation, yes. a, 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 con a combination of yeah. people's opinions of their concerns mm -hmm. that you're taking into regard, their own fears, and mm -hmm. of course the excitements. So if you're telling me that you need the law before actually do the consultations, that sounds a bit... Uh, un no, no, I'm, I'm saying mm -hmm. we have the law, mm -hmm. but within the, the process, mm -hmm. there is a provision for, for, for feedback. Mm -hmm. For consultation, for publics, for the public t t to to make a comment that on on, on whatever is being released. Okay. To the so pr thank you, uh, Dr. Sen Tongo. So Sen it becomes Tongo, you know, it becomes Teresa. important yes. and and, the ne and illegal. You have to 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 make sure that you post it in the gazette and whatnot, and you can get a feedback. Okay. Yeah. Good response, uh, Professor Nina. Just before I, I bring in the public uh, watching 
our viewing audience to call in and uh, also to keep more citations from uh, online. Uh, just help us understand the economic argument, okay? Uh, by except, okay, of course, biotech scientists are very enthusiastic about this, as I said, but so many other people are complaining that GMO seeds are non-regenerate because if you give me a seed which I cannot have a replicative regenerative uh, effect that if I get this seed today from the ground, I take it back into the ground. If that cannot happen, then that seems like a fleece. It's a commercial industrial uh, design to make people dependent on industries that are actually producing these GMOs. So help us just to in understand the economic uh, dynamics about this and how you think actually the world will perceive you with this in the background. Well, to begin with, it's not true that you don't get seeds that can't grow, okay? You can but get you can a get GMO seed and replant it and it grows? Of course, yes. and, and for the seeds from that plant will grow. The reason that people buy seeds is because there's a whole industry in the world that guarantees excellent seed to give you the highest harvest, disease-free. If you save your seeds from your last harvest, the chances are that some of the diseases that you had last year, you'll have again this year. So quality seeds is what drives people to buy seeds. In addition, hybrids, which are plants that are the children of two rather unproductive uh, plants, can often give you a much more vigorous plant with a much higher yield. If you plant the seeds from that, they will grow, but your yield will go down because this is a function of the very first generation. In the US, people launched all the same arguments when hybrids were first began, began to be adopted in maize. And that is back in the 1940s, 1950s. As people realized, as the farmers realized how much better they were, they galloped to adopt them. The same thing happens with genetically modified seeds. Everywhere in the world where they have been um, accepted, sometimes with a law. In other places, people have used existing statutes to regulate them. That's what happened in the US. But when, you see f when the farmers see how much their yields increase, they want to buy it. As a result, worldwide, GM crops have been adapted faster than any, in previous, any previous, uh, previously improved crops. This is particularly true in India, where, again, there's a lot of resistance, and yet they have adopted and accepted genetically modified cotton. And they've now become cotton exporters. And all the myths about the dangers, they realize that they're just myths. Mm -hmm. So can, I, can I add something? Okay, just slightly. I want to add something, something, because that is extremely <coughs> important, and the question keeps coming up. The seed, the seed. GMO will behave normally in terms of the seed. If it is GMO banana, you will use your sucker, as you have always used. If it is GMO cassava, you will use your stem, as you have always used. If it is GMO maize, with maize we have hybrids. And people in Uganda are already using hybrids. Hybrids tend to give you better yields. Um, in the first generation. In the, the first mm -hmm. generation. So you have to go back and buy seed. So if there was GMO maize and, he, and it is in the form of a hybrid, that is the only time you will want to buy new seed. And you will want to buy new seed and our farmers are buying new seed even with the conventional, with the maize you have today because they know the advantage. Farmers are very bright people. They will not buy this seed. If it doesn't perform well, next time they will not buy it. Mm -hmm. So you cannot... Uh, get a technology and put it on a table, and you know very well that the farmers cannot uh, cannot have seed. Farmers will either grow their use their own seed or buy seed when they have seen the advantage and the economics of that. Okay, so there's a good commercial value to all the people involved. In yeah, and you know, second, if there was the no farmers. commercial value, yeah. the researchers would be, you know, t we would take themselves off the market. Okay, on that yeah. note, yeah. let me go for a break. And I'm coming back with phone calls. I'm going to set out the opinions uh, from <laughs> Facebook and uh, on Twitter. And thanks to our viewers for keeping with us on this particular interesting and sophisticated subject. We'll be right back just after this break.
And thanks for joining us again. I'm Karaga Bodwins, and we are discussing the intricate subject of biotechnology and biosafety. And there is a bill which was tabled in 2012, and up to now it's still on the shelves, not yet signed. Uh, it's supposed to regulate and make protections and provide certain environment that can be able to have this technology applied in the country. So I'm going to have a number just right here on the on this lower third of uh, our set. Uh, you call in, give a response, because this is a national, a critical national matter of concern. So I, I need, we need here to hear from you and this panel and of course all stakeholders to understand what is going on uh, from your own perspective. And uh, on Facebook, I have uh, Black Ferrao, uh, who is saying that uh, our leaders are the, I'm not going to mention that, but it's, uh, edges on the element of not being wise. Uh, the planet has ever since uh, have, has ever seen uh, continue promoting this dependency. Our kids will starve to death. That is a response. I, unfortunately, I don't have <laughs> my panel, Professor Nina and uh, Doctor uh, 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 Teresa. I don't have any positive responses on Facebook. So let's hope uh, that uh, the calling is going to provide that particular. Uh, flavor of positivity about this technology. Uh, Dr. Teresa, just help us to understand again, because it's the law that we are all seeking up for to give us a regulatory framework and to see how we can have this technology adapted in a more same, a sane and acceptable manner. Why do we need this law? Uh, can't we use GMOs in any ordinary manner that uh, perhaps we're using ordinary seed? Yeah, and yeah somebody could ask why the law. Why is the law? I said, this is, we've signed the Katagina, it's called the Katagina Protocol on mm -hmm. Bisafety. Because, as you said, this is a global issue we are dealing with. So that uh, requires to have a regulatory system for genetically modified organisms. Because, you know, we're talking about food. Food can be any, any can move from one part of the country to another. So since this is a global issue, uh, th th this we come, we come, we are, Parties, we are parties of the Catalina Protocol on Biosafety, so we need a mechanism to make sure that. When was the Catalina Protocol uh, established, or rather, around propounded? 1970, 70s, mm -hmm. 71, 72, 73? Okay. I think that's when we ascended to sign the, the protocol ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and m many countries in the world, over 100 something countries, they have signed so that there is some. Mm, working together mm -hmm. uh, on this matter. Of okay, okay just lastly, mean. before I get to Professor Nina and I pick up the cause, the mm. uh, address the issue of corruption, yeah, yeah. of sus susceptibility to corruption by scientists from, mm -hmm. of course, the global biotech scientists and companies that are producing these GMOs mm -hmm. and proposing this technology. That actually the science scientists who are proposing to be part of these uh, regulatory committees and to be part of the lawmaking might be corruptly uh, kind of bought off to have things which we the ordinary people don't understand to be produced and to be uh, introduced into the country. Yeah, you, you are saying as if they would be bought off to produce something which would be bad. Yes, bad. exactly. There's but a sentiment out there. I'm, it's, it's, I'm just trying to make uh, a citation of these uh, comments that are coming in. Anyway, what, what I want to emphasize, mm -hmm. in the case of Uganda, it is our people. Our people is going to share the same food. Their children, their grandchildren are going to eat the same food. If you are, you are producing a bad food, a poisonous food, then for me it doesn't, it doesn't make sense, I'm sorry to use that word. Mm -hmm. because, because you can only be bought off if you are going to like make Mrs. money. What I know in Uganda, you know, the corruption is around what? Money, finances, goods, whatever, are being, being more advantaged than others. So I can't see how somebody would buy like the regulator is off to approve something which is bad, now to kill the people and to kill yourself as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, All I don't right. think that that one is likely to occur. Okay, okay. Professor Nina, th thank you indeed, uh, Dr. Uh, Teresa. So uh, as we talk about the, uh, is there anything you want to add about this? Because I wanted to talk about the, you to make any kind of uh, commentary on the future of this biotechnology. Do you feel it, it's I a... I think what I'd like <coughs> to add I mm -hmm. is a less extreme case, and that is that there's a, 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 a common... Uh, sentiment out there mm -hmm. that it's the big biotech companies that are trying to control our seed supply. Well, frankly, no biotech company has the power to force a farmer to buy their seeds. The farmers buy them if they're better. That is, if they bought 
Monsanto seeds, and they were expensive, and they didn't profit them at all, they wouldn't buy it again. They're not so dumb. So to give you some numbers on it, the farmers who have adopted biotech seeds, primarily corn and soybeans, worldwide over the period from 1996 to when the study was done in 2014, the average income of farmers increased by almost 70%. Mm -hmm. That's a big jump. Mm -hmm. That's why they go back and buy more seeds. Yeah, that's um, this is of which research? Uh, uh, this is a, a gentleman, uh, a, a, an agricultural economist in, uh, um, in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the future of technology, I, I hope I have callers on. Hello? Uh, if I have a call, please uh, get it through so that we have a conversation extended out of the studio. Hello? Okay, not yet. So the future of this technology, because if you're facing this kind of universe, okay, not universal, but overly Wide, spread, widespread. worldwide, yes, spread resistance and a, an impassioned kind of, uh, you know, distaste for this proposition. What do you feel is the future of this particular technology? Do you think it will reach a point and the world just comes to terms with it? And just the way we uh, take on planes now, of course, uh, I think in the early 60s, it was a, <laughs> a serious, uh, infathomable uh, just uh, issue to think that you can fly in the air in a big uh, object. So do you think we'll reach a point when GMOs are really not scary as they are now? or? in your own assessment, it's not going to happen? Well, for most new technologies, there are a period where there are stories about the terrible things like microwave ovens cause brain cancer and so forth. That's very common. When the Green Revolution strains came, began to be adopted, there were stories that they caused cancer, infertility, the whole gamut, okay? Mm -hmm. This is very common. What's different today is that those myths have been propagated mm -hmm. by, by organizations and people mm -hmm. that actually make money from vilifying the GMs. The GMs, okay. okay. Just on that point, just yeah. a slight, a, a slight uh, pause on that because I need, let's interrupt a little bit. And you're making a very brilliant point. It's just <laughs> I also need to hit to the core here. Hello? I can hear somebody calling. Hello? Somebody online? Hello? Yes, madam. Uh, you, good morning, and uh, just tell us your name and where you're calling from, then proceed to your comment. I'm Alan. Yes, Alan, uh, proceed please. Where are you calling from? And then you can proceed. Um, yes. Hello? I can hear you. What's your point? I'm saying uh, if uh, these GMOs do not test, like, I'm calling from Kampala. Unfortunately, I need sound in studio, uh, technical team. Uh, please continue. Okay, she's gone off. And unfortunately, I didn't also get uh, what she was saying at that point. You're going to be interrupted quite <laughs> uh, frequently quite in this right. way. Yes, so continue on that particular aspect. Hopefully, you still have the thread of it. The point is that there are organizations and individuals mm -hmm. who make a living off of scaring people. It's an awful lot easier to scare people than it is to unscare them. Mm -hmm. Once you're scared, once you've wrapped a cocoon of fear around a technology, it's very hard for people to go away from that. Mm. You can pile lots and lots of facts on them, which scientists are, f are happy to do, but it doesn't change minds. How do you change negative belief systems? That's a hard proposition. Mm -hmm. Okay, just a second. Hello, I can hear a buzz. Anybody out there? Hello? Hello? Oops. Hello? Yes, good morning. How are you? What's your name and where are you calling from? This is Ben, it's calling from Ginger. All right, I don't have sound in studio, uh, technical team. Yes, continue, sir. Uh, this is Ben, from Ginger. I can hear you very well. Yes, what's Actually, your point? This is what I'm telling the public is hmm. that they are being fixed by biotech companies like Kajik, Mosanko, and Fire to tell us guys about their models, which are the patented ready. Okay, unfortunately, unfortunately, your line is breaking. Unfortunately, I don't think you're hearing anything. Are you getting anything? I didn't understand. Unfortunately, um, your line is breaking. Sorry about that. Mm. Yes, you got yeah, something. Yeah, I, I think I got something like uh, 
getting Monsanto seed and whatever, mm -hmm. uh, patenting, patented, yes. and then we, we, we get, get lost in that. But besides the point, mm -hmm. what we are saying, whatever <coughs> varieties are going to be grown here, well, if they are game, was they will be done by our scientists. Because of the different climatic situations and the conditions, eh, you cannot import seeds from the U.S. and give them to the farmers here. You can get, wh what we are talking about is genes, wi which are going to be put in our own locally adapted varieties, which will be released, like the, uh, varieties are already released in Uganda, and the farmers will choose if they like that. Okay, so in your understanding and the past, so what and, and then things like yeah. maize, I mean things like uh, cassava and banana, we have already said. Monsanto has no interest in those things. So you, the fear is mentioned not about actually the technology itself. Mm. It's about the perceived commercial intrusion into the market here by the products of other industrial producers. Do, do you get the distinction in we, that? Well, in that, then yes. uh, th that is... So you're saying that actually there's no intrusion of foreign products that are done uh, a result of the biotech that is there's there's no, there no Monsanto seed which is going to come to Uganda. There's, there's no, no Monsanto seed which is on the market. No, it's just a technology maybe because you know Monsanto was like the most famous uh, biotech uh, company. Biotech company and it has produced many products which are on the market here elsewhere but not here. That's why people think everything is Monsanto. It's like a scare. <laughs> Monsanto scare. Okay. But scientists you know, I've mastered the technology, the, the getting genes from different things and uh, and putting them in, in the crops w where they could be of use. Mm. As, 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 uh, as the professor said yes, before. Yes, professor. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Can I Thank add to that? Yes. That that's not against Monsanto. Mm -hmm. As much as it's become the villain, the company villain, mm -hmm. um, again, I stress the fact that Monsanto has been very successful, sold a lot of seeds. Farmers would not buy it again if it did not profit them. Mm -hmm. So you're in defense of Monsanto, and it's a conglomerate. It's I a just big something very multinational obvious. company that is dealing in this industry. I think it's the pioneer, one of the pioneers in Correct. the Correct. So you understand uh, where people actually attach the conspiracy that uh, Monsanto is coming. It's a conspiracy theory. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any call online? Hello? Okay, no cause. So let's, let's just have conclusive remarks because I can't, but, but there is lots of responses online, uh, on YouTube and on mm -hmm. Facebook and on Twitter. So let's have conclusive remarks, especially, at, uh, and Dr. Sentong, I need you to help us understand the status quo about the law, the, 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 the bill, at which stage okay. are we, what is the resistance aspect, and then uh, 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 okay. Professor Nina, you wrap up okay. with your own. Yeah, thing. to say the bill right now, um, was passed by Parliament, but when it, it was taken to the President, he, some issues were raised. The President has always been very supportive of uh, GMO technology. We have interacted with him like during shows and whatnot, and he's always, he has taken trouble to understand uh, why scientists say they want to use it. I'm one of the lucky people because the President came to Kawanda in 2003, and he said, with the GMO, my scientists have talked to me as far as food is concerned, uh, you know, it is okay. Because this is like one gene which we, you, you know, you put among millions and millions of genes in the process and then it is regulated. So it is the only safe for, for my people to eat. But at that time he said, when it is seed, then I want my scientists to be in control, you know, not any other person. As we talk today, his scientists are in control. So I'm sure the president is very supportive of this uh, technology, but there are many people around him and the questions are being raised. So he came out and said, okay, these are questions being raised, please answer them. These questions have been answered by the, by, by the scientists. They've been looked at by the responsible committees in parliament. And the, I think now the report is ready. It is now being tabled again in parliament only to discuss how those uh, issues raised by the president, how they've been tackled, how they've been answered. And I'm sure when the parliament is also comfortable with the answers, the bill will be sent back to the president, and I'm sure he's going to approve it. It's a matter of time. Okay, thanks. Yeah, as long that. as the answers which have been given are satisfying to him. Mm -hmm. And if the sense that his people, he can always ask more, but we hope and pray that this time he'll be satisfied. And All right, yeah. thanks for that update. Yes, uh, Professor Nina, just to wrap up uh, communique on this so, so the discussion. The, 
the bottom line is that in spite of all the scare stuff that you can see on the internet and in publications, uh, worldwide, GMOs have been a very positive force, not just for increasing yields, but for um, sustainable agriculture. Mm -hmm. To sustain agriculture in the face of global population growth, you need the most modern science, and you need to move fast. Climate is changing faster than traditional breeding methods will allow us to keep up with it. So that's the real bottom line. And for all the scare tactics, no one, people have been looking for bad things for 30, 40 years now. And frankly, they haven't found them. Mm -hmm. Many, many studies have been done. And the GMOs that are on the market today are no different in nutritional value to those that were produced by older breeding methods. And there's no harm that has been done by them. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So trying to counter all the scare stuff is a real challenge. But it's about scare stuff. It's about myths. It's not about realities. Yeah, and we thank you indeed for partnering with us to come and expand on this issue. You are very experienced, uh, both of you scientists in this particular field. And I pray that your response is satisfactory to the viewer. But of course, we can continue having this discussion in different forum. You can even come back. Uh, we would be grateful to continue having this <laughs> message passed on. But thanks indeed, <laughs> Professor Nina uh, Fedorov and uh, Dr. Uh, Teresa Singuba, you've been prolific uh, panelists on this particular intricate subject. Thank you indeed. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. And our viewers, thanks for participating <coughs> with us here on air, of course, online. And uh, for those who called in and those who tried to call in and you couldn't because the, su the discussion here was really very uh, loaded. Uh, we thank you as uh, our partners, United States Embassy in Uganda and the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation for being our collaborators in bringing you this discussion. And if you are out there, you're a government institution, you are an NGO, you're a corporate company, and you want to have a focused discussion that is entirely of your choosing, come talk to our MD, talk to our sales team, talk to me, and please, let's have a great discussion and continue to make sure that we bring the world to you. This is NTV, Karagawa Borderlands. God bless.